Hello, one and all, ladies and gentlemen. It is Professor Hamamoto, and it is July 2nd, year 2023, 4 o'clock p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I hope you're doing all well and wonderful as we lead into the 4th of July celebration this coming Tuesday. I'm a little bit uh, out of sync here because... Um, Pride Month is over as of a couple days ago, yet I'm going to be addressing in honor of so-called Pride Month uh, one of the dark secrets still today to this day because the uh, women's and gender studies uh, mafia in academia, the policymakers who have gone through at least now two generations of LGBT programming who are now high-powered uh, attorneys and policymakers, and uh, insinuated at the high levels of Fortune 500 corporations, as well as academia, of course, and uh, your NGOs, whatnot, right? Um, they have to come to grips with um, a set of issues that um, uh, I would like to bring to your your attention today. And thank goodness we have original intrepid voices, journalists, people who publish, people who are for real, uh, whose identities are well known and have a lineage and that we could trace them. Um, not one of the public pundits, uh, a person who is um, accomplished in not just in the literary field, but uh, in the field of music as well. And without keeping you in suspense, her name is Moira Grayland. Now, she has only two or three, because I, I checked, uh, videos dedicated to her on, on YouTube. And unfortunately, the, the audio is really terrible. So I guess this has been in, before she became acquainted with, um, with YouTube technology. So I'm, I'm going to skip that part. And instead, I will, in a moment, be patient. In a moment, I'll be running a maybe three or four minute piece I think it's done by the editor of the book, which I'll show in a moment, of the book she wrote about her family, especially her mother and father, but but there was an extended family. I guess you could call her her mother-in-law slash cousin part of the, the nuclear family because it was a kind of a strange arrangements whereby, whereby um, her mother, who was a famous science fiction writer, which I'll get to in a moment, and her father, who was an accomplished writer in his own right, not in science fiction or in any type of fiction, but in numismatics of all topics. I started thinking about it, and I'm going to start checking more into the numismatic subculture because I think it's important because think about it. It's coin coins, right? Coin It's not just coin collectors. That's my naive impression. Oh, he was into coin collecting. No, no, I think there's something... Uh, metaphysical and uh, occultic about coins and themselves and money. We and I started thinking about, it. oh yeah, of course, William A. Wallace or one of the Wallaces. I forgot his initial. Who was the Secretary of Agriculture under? Um, I guess it was Franklin Roosevelt. He was a New Dealer, which means expectant socialist, one worlder. We're heading in that direction. That's Henry Wallace. And also a former, I'll get to the main topic in a moment, I promise you. It all fits in together by the end. <laughs> but he was also a candidate for the United States of America presidency, right? Now, this is a reminder because we came very close to having a um, Luciferian as the president. Maybe we, we already have <laughs> recently. I won't give any names because he has his intelligence assets still around there uh, operating out of Calorama in the uh, Washington, D.C. area. In fact, there's... Uh, intelligence to, to the effect that he, he's in effect running the U.S. presidency and the um, the true government from behind the scenes, even though he served two terms and he's going to put his boyfriend for another couple terms if he can. I don't know what they're going to do about the RFK Jr. Um, obstacle. You know, <laughs> it's going to be very, very interesting. But to finish up the Henry A. Wallace and the whole numismatics uh connection there with, with um, her name is Moira Grayland. You might have figured that out right now. And the book she wrote is called The Last Closet. Well, and I'm going to do a, 
uh, not a close reading, but sort of an overview, because I want you to buy the book yourself. Um, it's well, I know I always say, buy, buy the DVD, buy the book, read yourself. But in this case, um, uh, it, 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 at the risk of repeating myself or being redone, this is a must have. If you're interested in contemporary politics, 2023, beyond what is being pushed out there by indie media, primarily about GLBTQ and CRT, that, that stuff is was old when it started being pushed out there by all your indie uh, papa pundits, all right? It goes much deeper than that. I think that's why they, they were being supported and pushed and given incentives to, it's just like the UFO phenomenon, to kind of direct the, the attention away from, from a larger subterranean and fully, as I alluded to just a moment ago, institutionalized culture of of a child and um, that means minors, right? Under eight, age 18, in some cases 21, but also young, the abuse of young people, which would include college age. I think college age demographic are crucial in the discussion as well. It's not just sex abuse against children, which is horrific enough. And we hear enough about that. A lot of that is, is quite distracting and meant to be so as well, right? But um, the cohort, that is in the undergraduate level at community college, say, or maybe in grade 11, 12 in high school are really susceptible. I, I take it down to junior high school because I think that's when I first noticed that my buddies ah, were starting to get interested in science fiction. As soon as they turned 13, there was some kind of magical switch. They all wanted to go to the moon and uh, they were starting to to absorb the 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 whole NASA worldview headed by, well, he was second in command, if you want to put a fine point on it, by Dr. Wendel von Braun. They, they were, and I was subjected to the, to the same forces, but they started reading all, all the greats, all the science. And I read, you know, the basics like Isaac Asimov. You know, it's, it's, almost, it's almost required. I think it was required in some classes in high school. We had a teacher named Mrs. Brown, or maybe it was Miss Brown, and she was a science fiction nut. And it turns out she was one of the better school uh, high school teachers I ever had. Um, it's a Savannah High School. This is in Anaheim, California. And she used to talk about, um, you know, aliens every once in a not, not too much, not so where she'd get in trouble, but just enough so that the students would talk amongst themselves and say, you know, she's kind of out there, but we really like her. She's different. <laughs> Uh, and when was this? This, I guess, would be in the uh, late, mid to late 60s. All right. But all my, the point is my all my buddies were reading uh, people who I'd never heard. I mean, I only found out about Philip Dick because a friend of mine, he was a te teenager. I think we were in high school by this time, was a PKD nut. He, he, he had read all the books. I don't know how well he assimilated them. And that's typically how back then, before the age of the internet, right? It's kind of hard to re imagine that. But um, and, uh, before the days of, it, of the internet, you, had, you, you got this information from your friends, recommendations. And that's true, not just with fiction, but with, you remember this, with music, right? Whatever people listen to, you, you're going to go check it out. Or movies is word of mouth. And uh, there was no such thing as a, a social media influencer. What a term. Wow. Orwell would be so gratified to hear that term, influencer. <laughs> so anyway, um, but the point I'm making is that I was never one of those kids who dove into science fiction. Now, does that make me a better, more objective critic of it? No, it doesn't. I think it handicaps me because I'm only now beginning to go back and reread this material. Maybe, well, maybe it's better because maybe I never would have thought about it, but I'm going back and reading some of the old material, um, uh, not just the classics, but some of the more esoteric pieces, and I'm going on and buying used books, paperbacks, which are outrageously expensive. And back when they came out, they were like 50 cents. I know that, you know, even accounting for inflation, they're, they were dirt cheap back then, meant to be so. Um, but I, I'm just prefacing my comments today by, t by giving you the story of how I came to this months long now, it seems like an obsession 
uh, I keep coming back to science fiction. I already knew about popular culture and the popular fiction and movies, but in the last several months, I've been digging really deeply into science fiction. And I think one of the reasons why is because I had a nagging suspicion that there was something in the in between the lines. I call it crypto text. I don't know if that's my original term or not, but you have the text. And, and I know literary theory, there's something called the subtext, which I won't bore you with. But I have, and it was confirmed by reading Philip Dick's biography, I've always contended that in popular fiction or even literary fiction, so-called, uh, not, that's not a judgment call. I'm just, it's just a descriptor. Don't worry about it. But in so-called literary fiction, the type that's um, promoted through the middle brow, that is college educated readership of what was the great uh, New Yorker. I don't know who reads it now. I, I certainly don't. I never got into it either. Uh, but people like, um, and I suspect this for years, maybe decades by now, when after I first read a sort of an, um, an aborted attempt at a biography of uh, J.D. Salinger, or if you will, Salinger, right? Uh, it was by Ian Hamilton, who went on to write other outstanding biographies. But he was sued by the estate, so he had to kind of rewrite the book and, and recast his findings in a different light so he wouldn't uh, be sued out of existence. But we subsequently have learned that indeed J.D. Salinger I'll just say Salinger, just sounds like I say Heinz Kissinger. All right. Um, I'll give it the proper pronunciation uh, because I, I want I want you to understand that we're, we've been infiltrated. We Americans, because 4th of July, right, a couple of days, we've been infiltrated by at least unlikely countries uh, who were the stand-ins for larger bloodlines or empires. Bloodlines of the Illuminati. Okay, I'll say it. You know, read your sprint, uh, Fritz Springmeyer, Cisco, Houston. There's some uh, updating that needs to be done, but it's, it's substantially it's there, right? And man, many of you think you know it all because you have read that because that material's been out there forever and ever, but you don't. Uh, this is the, this is the 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 need that I'm trying to fill, right? Not Philip K. Dick, but I'm trying to I'm trying to. to to, to color in some of the line, the, the thick, clumsy lines that have been drawing in by so-called conspiracy theory experts. Um, so, I, so I think that drawing from my own observation of J.D. Salinger or Salinger, which proved to be right, he comes from the mind control, uh, intelligence, U.S. Army, World War II, and they had him set up over at the New Yorker, which turns out to be probably a CIA front operations. They ran American publishing. They still run it today. They run most, most of the media, including most of your pop-up pundits and most of these jerkwads who are starting to appear out of nowhere claiming expertise in this particular part of the world and this particular part of the world, right? I'm not saying the academic uh, perspectives and people who have professional training and expertise in the areas are that much better but at least at least that's what they do you know they, they're they're accountable for the uh their misdeeds their mistakes and the and some of the propaganda that they put out there these other jerk ones are not they're just pop-up pundits they're entertainers and i i know i complain about it incessantly but it's a huge problem because i don't want to be put in that little trick bag you understand uh, I, I have my own legacy, my own professional expertise and background and contributions that, that I must jealously guard. And I can't allow them to be watered down and debased by the company I keep. All right. And I'm not I'm speaking of of going back to my early professional areas. Uh, when you're nobody, no one wants to be seen with you. Yeah, you can't get the time of day. Right. They go to a conference and they're in sort of the covered wagon attack mode. They go into a little semi-circle and make sure you can't join into that circle. You see it all the time. Professional conferences, academic conferences, whatever it is, or UFO conferences, it's a, it's a little in-group there, right? So I call it the covered wagon formation. But then once you, your star begins to rise, then there's other people want to want to uh, bask in, not, not that I'm so great, but but I do have a, a list of objective uh, accomplishments and um, 
did enjoy a certain degree of staff. I wasn't a shot caller. I never wanted to be a kingmaker or a shot caller. Um, so that's why I'm I'm providing you the sort of background of the intellectual history of science fiction. Yes, there is something called an intellectual history of science fiction. It's not a bunch of 12, 13 year old numb nuts like my friends who are reading, oh yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. yeah. Oh, one day we're gonna merge with robots and we're gonna, I never bought into it. I told you one of the main reasons because it was so anti-Asian, all the, all the aliens were Asian looking, right? Uh, not just in the books, but in the movies. And they, they had the same look all the time. And that was part of the Cold War propaganda system. It was also meant to take away the attention from, um, see, what did um, Roseanne Barr call him? I can't remember. She had a term for him. We call them the Hazarians. But um, uh, th those uh, Hazarians, and I'll, I'll mention one specific right now before we go into Maura Grayland. I've been digging into him and I've been begging people who've been watching over the months to check into him instead of just looking on Wikipedia and looking up the same old, same old biographies of the same old, same old sexy Nazis. Why don't you stretch a little bit, right? And that goes for everybody, including myself. So in stretching, I'm finding out more about Ugo Gernsbach or Hugo Gernsbach. He anglicized his name, by the way. It was Bach, B-A-C-H. And he thought by replacing the H with a K that it's going to make him more of it. And I mean, he can get by with Hugo. You know, it's pronounced Ugo in his home country of Luxembourg, which I'll talk about in a moment. But in America, there's enough Hugos around where he can pass, right? So all it takes is the removal of an umlaut over a U um, and the, um, the removal of an S from a name or an N, you know, instead of Hoffman, it's Hoffman. You know, you can anglicize your name and and hope to pass in American society, right? Seems to be a common str strategy there. But Hugo, Hugo Gernsbach, I'm going to show you how it all fits in in a moment. Be patient. I got a really good video for you. Hang on. This this, this introductory part is not for the looky-loos. You'll be rewarded. Your patience will be rewarded in a moment. So Because it's a really good piece. And, and I just got an idea. I think all publishers should do pieces like this to promote their publications, such as this one here. It's a brilliant idea. It's good video. It's it's a good, it's good graphics. Every I'll, I'll share in a moment. It's a short movie. Um, but anyway, just since this talk is not about Ugo Gernsbach, but it's about um, these two pedophiles. And when I say that, um, I'm not saying this using this term gratuitously. Walter Breen, who was the father of Moira Grayland, was a convicted child abuser. His first conviction was way back in 1954. I was barely on earth when he was already molesting kids. But he wasn't in prison for a whole lifetime of molesting kids. Boys, girls, teenagers, even adults. Um, the way Moira, Moira uh, Grayland put it, said that he would like to sleep with anybody with a pulse. Humans, I suppose, you know, um, I don't know if he was into interspecies sex, but it wouldn't surprise me. And that's probably going to be promoted next because that is the um, the goal of the real uh, agenda behind so-called Pride Month, right? They didn't tell you what pride is, the pride part is. It's pride in, in Satanism, right? It's not pride in your identity as gay or GLBT or whatever call it a rainbow you select, but it's pride in Lucifer, right? Because by the way, I, I from what I read, and someone will have to confirm this, that the, the pride uh, flag is not the full spectrum. It's only, it's lacking one, right? Deliberately so. They don't make these types of mistakes. Just like Henry Wallace, to go back to my earlier non-finished story, was the guy that's responsible for putting the pyramid and the, the eye, <laughs> the all-seeing eye in the back of the dollar bill. That's Henry Wallace. The pre-socialist, socialist, Blavatskyan occultist, who, and that's why I said, okay, yeah, numismatics does matter. And that was Walter Breen's specialty. He got publications, got awards for his contributions there. Uh, he, he made a pretty good living at it, help other people uh, cash in on their wise purchases with, with him consulting. Uh, there's more specifics here. And, and if you really want to get into Walter Breen's 
biography, uh, read, read, read his own work. He did an autobiography. I haven't read it yet. I don't know if I will, but I, I probably do because I tend to want to read everything that that's out there. But um, yeah, he's talked about this, but you can, if you're interested in that. So numismatics matters. It's not a bunch of coin collectors, weirdos, just like the U of, you know, whatever, whatever group is out there. I, you know, again, I have to always remind myself, take it seriously. Don't just, don't just play it off as being a hobby or something like that. There's something deep going on there. And it's up to you. It's up to me to find out what's going on. As it turns out, Walter Breen was a, uh, used his expertise and his access in order to molest um, children. Uh, some of them underage. And when I say children, that would also mean older teenagers. You know, I, I still think they're, they're children. <laughs> Supposedly, your brain doesn't fully mature until it's like 25 or something. And legally, supposedly, you're you're an adult by 21 at the latest, right? But anyway, I'm not going to uh, dwell on it. The point is that Breen um, was of that ill, so when I call him a pedophile, and I don't know what the technical charges were, uh, it's not gratuitous. And the reason why I lump or link um, Marion Zimmer Bradley which is his wife, um, in, in, into that category is because, as it turns out, she was complicit, if not helped facilitate Walter Breen's predilections. And as you will see in a moment, Moira Graylin has made the claims in more than one place in this book of hers, Autobiography. And by the way, I, I don't want to get give you the idea, the false idea that She's just a one-dimensional victim, right? Um, far from it. Uh, despite all the hardships she's had to overcome and the abuse, I mean, she chronicles it without any sort of self-pity in a very sober, straightforward. And she even gets into some really good psychoanalytic uh, observations about her life and her parents' life and her grandparents' life, which I think is pretty sound. And you know how how prejudiced I am against psychoanalysis, but I think it had, I don't even know why we should call it psychoanalysis. We should just call it writing, you know, or observation, you know, that, that psychoanalysis is a trademark that was, that was applied to something that people from time immemorial have been doing with their lives, common sense, observation, talk, gossip, dreaming, all of it. So, uh, Freud's big revolution, when I say Freud, I'm talking about his, his whole court, cohort, his big uh, revolution was the fact that they, they were able to, in their minds at least, slay God, right? The God of Ibrahim or the God of Abraham. They were able to do it in the guise of a pseudoscience called psychoanalysis or analytic, well, all the different offshoots of it. Um, and, and it's uh, kissing cousin, if not its uh, nourishing roots, that would be the, the, the Gnostic philosophical tradition, which is also, as you remember, part of the background reading that we're doing here. And um, I, th I think um, Marion Zimmer Bradley and Walter Breen, whether they called it Gnostic sexuality or not, were nonetheless, despite themselves, were consciously, self-consciously, to the point of proselytization, that is recruitment, through their writings, through their social gatherings, through their meetups at conferences, fan meetings, you know, like SF clubs or numismatic conventions. And Breen, uh, Walter Breen had techniques for picking up little teenage boys, for example, at his, at uh, the, the uh, what was back then so, akin to something called Comic-Con, right? You, you're kind of familiar with that. It's kind of that scene, but on a much smaller scale, right? But he'd have certain techniques. He brings some kind of uh, gizmo or something and play with it and and dangle and invariably some 12 year old kid's gonna like look at it and be mesmerized by it and he starts you know being friendly to the little boy and you know when within a few months it might take him a year he's very patient he always had these little boys in different stages of grooming and she you know graystone or grayland i'm sorry keep pronouncing mispronounce your last name moira grayland talks about all the different techniques that 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 her father and her mother and other people who were in their circle, because it wasn't just them. It was a social circle, right? 
and I guess they're all over the country. They're probably, I, I would imagine um, that these circles are most prevalent in um, university towns, college towns, because they, they were operating in Berkeley. Because if you're, you know, you, you know the image of Berkeley, right? It's Hippieville and, and you can pretty much do whatever you want. It's not going to raise any suspicion. And by the way, another Berkeley, I, uh, I guess he would be roughly the same age as Moyer or Grayline. I wonder if they knew each other. Another Berkeley was, was Philip K. Dick, which is another reason why I was attracted to the story of this couple who turned out to be full-time um, uh, abusers, sexual abusers and groomers, right? And by the way, um, as I'll talk about in a moment, this had professional repercussions. Okay, this is not just me passing moralistic judgment on... Marion Zimmer Bradley. Who am I after all? You know, so don't call me a homophobe. If you do, that's okay either. I, I'm, I will, I will call shit out and I, I will do it. I don't care. So I'm not worried about, it. I'm just saying that for, for your satisfaction, I do know that Marion Zimmer Bradley has been um, pointed to and discussed thoroughly by her own peers in science fiction and in writing. How do I know this? Because I do my homework. You know, I'm not some guy who goes to some foreign country and says I'm an English teacher and I get hired to teach English. And then I become an expert. <laughs> I, I ran into all kinds of those type of people when I was in Japan. Right. There are white guys married usually to Japanese women. They marry a local woman who knows the language and can fill out all the forms and all that. And all of a sudden they're an expert on Japan. They know everything. But they wouldn't ask me. They wouldn't ask me. I don't put the right right profile. And they call it, there's a term where it's called a zero to hero phenomenon. So if you're a young person, your career's languishing, move to another country, especially a so-called second or third world country and teach English. You will be greeted there as a hero and probably get a pretty good pay. You know, and you get married to someone who doesn't know any better. <laughs> She'll just think you're a rich American. You know, and she's going to hopefully... She's in a, she's hoping that you'll probably take her back to America you know, on your um, your U.S. citizen passport. I'm familiar with that whole scene. Do you understand that? And it's getting really bad now. I see them all uh, covering China, Japan, South Korea. No one from North Korea because they're very suspicious of these characters running around free. And I see them in Thailand. It's under the guise of a travel or cross country, you know, cr cross cultural. Examine. Sometimes, sometimes it's very lighthearted. Or we're just going to take a look at the food culture, sort of harmless, like Anthony Bourdain, who I outed, by the way, as an intelligence asset in one of my previous talks, which leads me to ask you at this point to please subscribe to this channel so you can find aforesaid piece on Anthony Bourdain. It's called Anthony Bourdain Eats Cambodia. Very quickly, his father, as turns out, was with the Sudete, France. And they're the ones who held the whole opium empire where he likes to go, the, the so-called uh, triangle, right? The opium triangle, <laughs> you know, Indochine, remember that? Yeah, and then the Japanese said, get out of here, you know, Asia for the Asians. And then, uh, you know what happened, World War II, right, because they wanted – the CIA, the, the opium families of New England and the bankers wanted the opium. So they fought World War II and they expended a lot of lives in the process on all, all sides of the conflict. And uh, they took it over until the Vietnamese finally had their war of, of uh, liberation against American imperialism. That's what they call it. They call it the American War. We call it the Vietnam War. They call it the um, the, the War of Nap National Liberation against American uh, imperial imperialism. That's how it's translated, roughly, right? Um, I wound up in Hanoi on Ho Chi Minh's birthday. <laughs> I didn't know. I was so stupid. I didn't know that everything was shut down, but it, everybody was in the street. It was Uncle Ho's birthday. And uh, that was my first introduction to Hanoi. And, of course, I went to all the military machine, uh, museums and uh, toured the country that, uh, that uh, we American. I won't say we Americans on the 4th of July. The Masters of War, the Pentagon people, like Ad, um, General Waste Moorland, as we used to call them, those people, 
Robert McNamara, all those characters. I'm not, those are the ones. Those 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 are the the people who who escaped uh, crimes against humanity, being put on trial for Nuremberg type um, atrocities against humanity. So, um, and and the reason I mention that is because I will argue. And this is going to really piss off a lot of science fiction fanboys. And I say fanboys because, I don't know, 90, 95% of science fiction and fantasy are boys, are men. And they're also teenagers at that really impressionable, vulnerable point where they're adopting a worldview. So all the people that are that are running the NIH now under Fauci, because he's he's even older than me. He's a fossil from a from a previous uh, era. But his successors and all the other people who were in the bureaucracy, the press secretaries, uh, the uh, State Department, all that in the military as well as in, in the corporations, they they have grown up in this particular milieu that was being conditioned by people like. Uncle William Shatner, right? I mean, he was only a character, but you know, we can talk about the Star Trek fr uh, franchise and the whole UFO deal and all that. But preceding that was science fiction literature books, and the guy that brought it. See, this is a long way of getting back to Hugo Gernsbach. <laughs> it it comes back to me eventually. I start to tune out with a with a theme and I go into the variations, but I have to come back to the theme. Now, Hugo Gernsbach was a Luxembourgian. And then when you, you know, you recall, wow, Luxembourg, um, what's the history of that country? Who's really in charge? It's a little tiny, it's the mouse that roar, roared. You know, we, we make fun of little tiny countries. Again, counterintuitively, you've got to check yourself and, and, and don't be dismissive. That's where you got to look. You got to look at the overlooked. And Luxembourg is one of them. It's a banking center. It's been a banking center for centuries, including today. And also uh, a uh, breeding ground, literally and figuratively, for all these powerful houses, banking families, and uh, nobility of Europe and, and the New World Order today, who are still behind the Great Reset and Klaus Schwab and all those people. It goes back to Luxembourg. So they sent this ambitious Hazarian named um, Hugo Gernsbach, who was born in Luxembourg City, in Luxembourg, and he emigrated to the United States in 1904. 1926, he was already publishing. He's considered to be the founder of the science fiction genre. And um, what was the first publication where she got paid? Marion Zimmer Bradley. What was her first professionally paying article? Because when you started as a writer, you're, you're writing for free, right? You, you're trying to get on. You're trying, you'll do anything. You'll gig for free. Uh, and even when you're a professional, it's hard to get paid. You know, you don't get any money. There's no money in, in publishing, I, I tell you. But anyway, her first publisher publishing gig was with Amazing Stories. And that was founded by Ugo Grensbach in 1926. Now, did he sit her down? You're going to be promoting pedophilia to the American public, and you're going to be pimping out the young children of America and the larger industrializing world. No, he didn't do that, but he's not going to buy your work unless you are in ideological conformity to his agenda. And his agenda is a Frankist Sabbatean agenda, right? I'm fairly sure of it. I have that's where the research is required to go into, but that's my working hypothesis. How do I infer this? Well, one of once he started, and where was the money coming in? You can't just, especially back then, these days, it's not that as difficult. You all you need is a computer, and they have built in software where you can write your own books and have them published with, with no overhead to you. And then Amazon will take the lion's share, but you can get your books out there pretty quickly. That's probably the model I'm going to be using. But back then, in order to publish, you, you nobody can do it. Not just anybody. You have to have press. You have access to press, hardware, and capital. So, But uh, despite all those constraints, he was able to publish a fairly specialized publication for the educated uh, reader called Sexology. I've talked about this before, and it keeps coming back to me. And there's a whole... Um, 
uh, anthology of some of his classic articles here. Um, he didn't write them, but he, he anthology. He did write some of them, but uh, some fascinating material. Adolf Hitler's Secret Sex Life. Oh, my gosh. This is published in 1958. This is a public, you know, I was a kid at the time, but this is a publication, the type of publication that I would have read if I was a college student. Back then. Sex and Satan. I mean, all kinds. This was Ugo Gernsbach. So this, again, I'm showing you this is because I'm trying to substantiate my working hypothesis that this is a Sabatine Frankist intervention in American popular culture through science fiction. And it was played out by through people like her mother, Moira Grayland's mother. And she wasn't the only one. Okay. If she was the only one, then I would have no argument. Right. But if I can point to many more people and I can show you the weirdness of this whole science fiction fanboy subculture going back decades, then my hypothesis becomes a theory. And I think I'm on the brink of a theoretical breakthrough at this very moment. Gosh, I'm beginning to talk like Peter Lorre in the film M, Psycho Killers. You know, there's no, it's no accident it came out of the fervid imagination of Fritz Lang of Berlin in Ufa doing the Weimar Republic just as Hitler was taking over. And he would meet with, with the, the Nazi commissars of art whenever um, El, um, you know, Ed Director came in, uh, he would come right in and, and, and not have to make an appointment and talk about movies because they understood the propaganda value of films like Metropolis, which, by the way, was written by his wife, Greta von Harbo. And she's not into Scientology because this is just English language writers, but she's a, a definitely a very important figure in science fiction, regardless of gender. And by the way, there's a really good introduction here by a professor of science fiction. This is how she describes herself. Um, professor of science fiction at the School of Literature, Media, and Communication at Georgia Tech. Perfect, right? Good introduction, but she she points out that at the very beginning of, of the genre, science fiction genre, women were involved with it. And that's why this book is full of people going back to the late 20s up to, I think it ends around the late 60s, early 70s, with Ursula K. Le Guin, who, by the way, was also a Berkeley person. I've talked about her before. Do you want me to remind you? So anyway, let me finish up with Ugo uh, Gansbach. He... I won't say courted because that has certain connotations. He encouraged women to submit work to his science fiction publications because his publication firm, uh, Amazing Stories, the, the parent company, I guess it was called Experimenter Publications, right? And I, I always thought it was about social scientific and biological scientific exploration and experiments, science experiments. That's what you usually think of when you, when someone says, oh, it's an experiment, right? No, I think it was his, yes, sure. But I think his definition expanded to cultural, social, behavioral experimentation, right? It's right there in black and white, experimenter publications. And guess who the guinea pigs are? <laughs> Do I have to tell you? <laughs> Yeah, I'm in. I'm in that bag too. I'm. I'm. I'm very much in. In with you, <laughs> uh, but I'm not content to stay there. I don't think you are either. Uh, we're going to flip the script on these mothers. We're going to write our own fiction. We're going to do our own shows. We're going to make our own movies, and we're going to celebrate Pride Life, right? Celebration of human life and of God, right? not the celebration of elite deviance. And that's not a phrase of my of my coining. I got that title from a book called Elite Deviance. And, and one of its, well, its main argument is that stop looking at all the gangsters out there burning uh, trash cans out in uh, Nanterre, outside of Paris, you know, the, the, all this, <laughs> these rioting. It's really interesting to see that people have not lost their fight 
right? I'm not even going to argue about who's right, who's wrong, if it's a thug here, a thug there, where they came from, immigrant, non-immigrant. Okay, I'm just seeing that people have not lost the spirit of popular resistance. And I know there's probably some groups that are behind it, probably the French Communist Party. I'm just guessing, right? But there are other people who are trying to take advantage of, of the chaos there, right? They're, they're always, always are, right? <clears throat> so let me, uh, before I lose my audience here, let me at least show, oh, just to show you that science fiction is indeed an equal opportunity, uh, perverted um, literary genre that two, three, four, five generations of Americans have grown up now, and they're all in charge of us. No wonder we believe in mRNA. No wonder we, we we bow down to the people in the white coats because we've we've been inculcated thanks to Ugo Gensbach, the Luxembourgian, who comes from the House of uh, Kohlberg, uh, how, related to the House of Nassau, by the way, right? They're the ones who run, ran the duchy, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, and they have a footprint here in America. And by the way, I, I my recent research, and I do research, I don't Google, I do research. I found that there's a, a very large, a significant uh, Luxembourgish, they call themselves, uh, diaspora in the United States, especially around the time when Gernsbach came. He wasn't just a one-off. There was a wave of Luxembourgians who were coming in to undermine America in its early industrial stage. And science fiction, the science fiction worldview and the model and epistemology and behavior, and including sexology, was going to be part of that grand plan. They were going to do it through the literature, and it's run by Rothschild as the banking families. Now, so you, see, so you understand how how Fritz Springmeier comes in here and the bloodlines of the Illuminati and all this supposedly ancient history, how the university thing comes in here? Orange, House of Orange. I mean, that's Princeton University. That's Institute of Advanced Studies, right? What's their school colors? Orange. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, that's just one example of it. So that was that was um, so so keep checking into Uga Gansbach, please. We have about enough information on Werner von Braun as we'll ever need for the next twenty years. If there's some new stuff, you know, fine. But you're you're not in teaching me or most any anybody anything new when you just keep retrading this old uh, these old tires. Okay, so let's go into the. The um, okay, before I forget, though, I want to show you that science fiction was open to black people and black gays, such as this man that's Samuel R. Delaney. All right, good looking stud. Maybe that's how he got over. I don't know, right? Maybe he got over on pure talent. I don't know. Umberto uh, Echo likes him, but as you know. I suspect Professor Umberto Eco himself was connected through his university and through his family line. And he was sending out these crypto messages in his whole series, right? Beginning with the Brotherhood of the, um, what is it called? The first, the very first novel. I read it with interest. Saw the, saw the movie with Sean Connery. In the Name of the Rose. There you go. Yeah. How, how does a guy who's a, full-time professor and archivist and public intellectual because he'd write little pop. He was into popular culture, by the way, right? He'd write pop culture pieces, but he's also writing these large entertainments for the American public and for the international public. So Umberto Echo loves Delaney. Delaney was as queer as a $3 bill. He, My introduction to Samuel Delaney, to his work, not him personally, was when I was teaching at NYU back in 1999, I think. Yeah, 99, 2000, around there. And I uh, went to the bookstore. I think it was Shakespeare and Son or something, right? right? Right across the street from the campus on the other side of Broadway bookstore. And right there on display was a book about by Delaney about the sexual culture, how he came of age. He was a Times Square. This is when Times Square was a real seedy part of the city before... It became Disneyland for people, you know, tourists, out-of-towners, right? It was really run down and had the strip shows and prostitution. Um, it has some of that, but it's now more family-friendly, right? So 
So De Delaney would go, this book was all about his sexual encounters there and how it liberated him as an individual, as a black man, as a gay. And this is before Stonewall down on the other side of town on the, on, uh, in, uh, in the West Village. Right. You, you know that story, right? <clears throat> Stonewall Rebellion was a kid. He was doing this stuff in the late 40s and 50s because look how what a handsome buck he was. Woo wee. Yeah. So here he goes, an endorsement by him. William Gibson says in his introduction, Dalgan is a, a riddle that was never meant to be solved. And, and I think fundamentally he's right. It's a book that doesn't give you. Okay, I won't, I won't bore you with that. I just wanted to show you that science fiction has always been somewhat porous because it wasn't competing with New Yorker and the Saturday Evening Post, you know, the, the, the uh, supposed literary establishment was going around it. And even lower than that were comic books. And that's a little bit more easy to understand. We, I did a talk on Professor Marston, who was a psychologist at Harvard who invented Wonder Woman, right? I've done so subscribe so you can find that one in there all these pieces of mine that i've been doing have a cumulative effect in a in a in a, in a semi-common theme right so comic book william and william gaines mad magazine right he was my teacher mad magazine was the was the publication of my circle of friends who aspired to a certain type of status in society <laughs> which is being a hipster, a beatnik, an outsider, something like that. Well, his dad published, you know, EC, Educational Com Comics, and hired Marston to legitimize it because the Congress was coming down. Anyway, you, you, you know that part of the story. Science fiction went through the same type of process. But today it's been normalized. It's been institutionalized. Like I told you, this woman is a professor. Maybe it's an endowed chair. She's a professor of science fiction at Georgia Tech. All right, that gives you an idea of the degree to which this genre, which was, which was always fighting for respectability when I was introduced to it, is now part of this. Because they grow, the people who read it grew up and they went to school, they went to grad school, they got PhD, they got, they got endowed chairs at Georgia Tech, in addition to going to NASA and, and joining the Pentagon and becoming a... Uh, um, consultants like uh, not James Elephantis, but uh, one of the two brothers, the Pizzagate brothers, who was promoting UFO. It became part of, I don't want to use the term, but I'll, I will, zeitgeist, right? Became normalized. And with it came the full package. You didn't realize it, but with it comes the pedophilia. With it becomes the polymorphous perversity as one, maybe that was a Freudian formulation. I don't know. A lot of it, and with it came came so-called Pride Month, because we are going to become the Pride Society, the Pride World, the Pride Post-Human, Transhuman Society. It's going to be a Pride in our own self-regarding Gnostic Luciferian self. That's at the heart of it. That's what's all behind this too. This is the animating force behind science fiction, I would argue from the very beginning, Ugo Gernensbach brought it with him with, along with his Sabatine Frankism. And most of these writers in here, including Earth, Ursula K. Le Guin and Philip Dick, as I mentioned, absorb this secular anti-God uh, um, reality for themselves. And that's only now beginning to be recognized how thoroughly that's been assimilated by people, by, your own name made by yourself. Look at, I got some candles back there. I know they have fake LED candles and people are into sense and, and um, you know, holistic medicine. There's, you know, if you look into anything alternative now, there's always some, some guy or gal there who's giving you some sort of holistic Gnostic vibes. You have to buy into the whole Gnostic worldview if you join into it, right? And, it's, and it comes from the intelligence agencies. It comes from Central Intelligence Agency. Right. By the way, another prominent Luxembourgian, along with Hugo Gernsbach, a generation later, I discovered, was uh, Edward Steichen. He was born in Luxembourg. He's the famous 
god of photography and it makes sense he was also the guy who curated the the brotherhood of man or what's that book 1955 the universal it's the cia publication right but how it's all universal brotherhood and we're all going to come together in the new age and we're all going to write it's not total blavatsky right which which henry wallace was was influenced by nicholas rorick and elena rorick who are americans who had been through Siberia, so Tibet, and all these areas, right? These are some of the, the the characters, by the way, that Putin's trying to kick out because they've they've been trying to uh, take over the Slavic peoples in Central Asia uh, for quite a while through 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 stealth. All right, remember Edward Steichen. Look him up. All those great black and white prints that we were schooled to to love and adore and respect. Uh, he's a Luxembourgian. He's part of the Luxembourgian. Um, diaspora think diaspora right not just the obvious groups the chinese diaspora indians south asian diaspora right jewish diaspora yeah look for the smaller ones like the maltese diaspora small but potent right just like that creepo uh the um the mayor what's his name he's a maltese american his father was a professor um at uh notre dame university of notre dame his name will come to me in a moment. Um, he, he'll 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 be running for president one day. Okay, so let's take a look at this introduction to this book. I realized after <laughs> I I've been trying to avoid reviewing this. It's really there's some really ugly and horrendous scenes in here, and that's why I'm telling you to read the book. I don't because I'm reacquainting myself with it. I said oh, I realize why I've been avoiding this topic, but we're at a point now where we where there avoidance is not possible right because this type of, of activity has become institutionalized through the uh free you know meaning uh, free passage unrestricted uh immigration from the south southern border of the united states and also from the north but and from this from the sea pacific and uh, atlantic but mostly from the south right now think of all the children that are coming in right now who are going to be unaccounted for right they need fresh blood and I mean that literally. All right. You use your imagination to figure out what I'm implying. Okay. Because even I have my limits. So let's take a look at the uh, uh, editor's name is Vox Day of this book. And it's the same introduction in here, but he does a much better job. He puts it in visual terms. Let's check it out. Turn your sound up. <laughs> Forward. I read four or five of Marion Zimmer Bradley's books in high school. I started with The Heritage of Haster, then read two or three more Darkover novels that caught my eye in the Arden Hills Library. While I didn't find them sufficiently entertaining to continue with the series, they were just interesting enough to inspire me to pick up a trade paperback of The Mists of Avalon, not long after it was published by Del Rey in 1984. I still have that much ballyhooed monstrosity, its long untouched pages now yellowing on a dusty bookshelf in the attic. The Mists of Avalon was a massive 876-page bestseller, heavily marketed as a feminist take on Camelot and the legends of King Arthur, and was critically hailed for being very different than the usual retellings of the classic tale. It was different, with its grim darkness and overt sexuality. The Mists of Avalon might even be considered a predecessor of sorts to George R.R. R. Martin's A Game of Thrones. I found it to be too much of a soap opera myself, although there were a few salacious sections that did serve to liven up the book considerably. But even as a red-blooded young man, some of those sections struck me as perhaps a little too salacious. While I can't say that I had any inkling of what the author's habits or home life were at the time, I can say that I detected a slight sense of what I can only describe as a wrongness from the book. Arthur didn't love Guinevere, but was pining away for his half-sister. Sir Lancelot was not only Galahad, but also Arthur's bisexual cousin. Instead of being a tragic love triangle, Arthur, Lancelot, and Guinevere were a swinging threesome, and Mordred was not only Arthur's son, but the product of incest knowingly orchestrated by Merlin for pagan purposes to boot. That's just weird, and more than a little grotesque. I don't recall if I ever actually finished the novel or not, but I know I didn't bother reading any of its many sequels. I felt that I had given this vaunted feminist author a fair shake, and delved as deeply into Ms. Bradley's strange psyche as I wished to go little knowing that what I dismissed as freakish feminist literary antics were merely scratching the surface on what was actually an intergenerational psychosexual horror show. Three decades later, 
Despite being a science fiction author and editor myself, I found myself increasingly at odds with the creepy little community known as SF Fandom, which can best be described as the cantina crowd from Star Wars, only depressed, overweight, and sexually confused. I was also becoming increasingly aware of a wrongness that emanated from that community like a faint but unmistakably foul odor. There were rumors about the real reason behind science fiction grandmaster Arthur C. Clarke's bizarre relocation from Southern California to Sri Lanka. There was the arrest of David Asimov, son of science fiction legend Isaac Asimov, for the possession of the largest stash of child pornography the police had ever seen. There were the public defenses offered by many science fiction authors on behalf of the SFWA member and convicted child molester Ed Kramer. There was the naming of NAMBLA enthusiast and homo horror porn author Samuel Delaney as SFWA's 2013 Damon Knight Memorial Grandmaster. And then, of course, there was the historical Breen Doggle, a 50-year-old debate among science fiction fandom concerning whether a child molester, Walter Breen, should have been permitted to attend the science fiction convention known as Pacificon II or not. Believe it or not, the greater part of fandom at the time was outraged by the committee's sensible decision to deny Breen permission to attend the 1964 convention. Science fiction fandom continued to cover for the notorious pedophile even after his death in 1993. In Conspiracy of Silence, Fandom and Marion Zimmer Bradley, Martin Wiss wrote, Why indeed did it take until MZB was dead for her covering for convicted abuser Walter Breen to become public knowledge and not just whispered amongst in the no fans? Why in fact was Breen allowed to remain in fandom, being able to groom new victims? Breen, after all, was first convicted in 1954, yet could carry out his grooming almost unhindered at SF cons until the late 90s. And when the 1964 Worldcon did ban him, a large part of fandom got very upset at them for doing so. The fact that fandom had been covering for pedophiles for decades was deeply troubling. And yet, we would soon learn that this wrongness in science fiction ran even deeper than the most cynical critics suspected. On June 3, 2014, a writer named Deidre Sayers Moen put up a post protesting the decision of Tor Books to posthumously honor Tor author and World Fantasy Award winner Marion Zimmer Bradley on the basis of Bradley's 1998 testimony given in a legal deposition about her late husband. When Moen was called out by Bradley fans for supposedly misrepresenting Bradley, she reached out to someone she correctly felt would know the truth about the feminist icon, Moira Grayland, the daughter of Marion Zimmer Bradley and Walter Breen. Little did Moen know how dark the truth about the famous award-winning feminist was, for when Moira responded a few days later, she confirmed Moen's statement about Marion Zimmer Bradley knowing all about her pedophile husband's behavior. However, she also added that her famous mother had been a child molester as well, and that in fact, Bradley had been far more violently abusive to both her and her brother than Breen. I will not say more about the harrowing subject of this book, because it is the author's story to tell, not mine. But I will take this opportunity to say something about the author, whom I have come to admire for her courage, for her faith, and most of all, for her ability to survive an unthinkably brutal upbringing with both her sanity and her sense of humor intact. Moira does not wallow in her victimhood nor does she paint her victimizers as soulless devils. Indeed, her empathy for those who wronged her so deeply is more than astonishing. It is humbling. Her strength of character, her integrity, and her faith in a God she was raised to believe did not exist are almost inexplicable, particularly in an age where adult college students cannot face unintended microaggressions without the support of their university administrations, the campus police, and physician-prescribed pharmaceuticals. Her story is more than a triumph of the human spirit, more than a tale of survival, and more than a devastating indictment of a seriously depraved community. It is an inspiration to everyone, particularly for anyone who has ever been subjected to abuse or ill treatment as a child. Moira's message is clear. They can hurt you, they can harm you, and they can leave you with scars that last a lifetime, but they cannot touch your soul. Their sins are not your sins, and their shame is not your shame. And there is a light that is always waiting to heal those who summon the strength to walk out of the last closet and turn their back on the darkness inside it. Welcome, welcome, all of you sex fiends. We didn't see you at any of those other intellectual conversations. It must be the transgressive sexuality. <laughs> I'm reading a quote from Pat Califia's, one of my favorite books, Public Sex, The Culture of Radical Sex. Being a sex radical means being defiant 
as well as deviant. It means being aware that there's something dissatisfying and dishonest about the way sex is talked about or hidden in daily life. It also means questioning the way our society assigns privilege based on adherence to its moral codes and in fact makes every sexual choice a matter of morality. I'm just, you know, kind of crazy and awed to be here with Chip, otherwise known as Samuel Delaney, because yes. I told him <laughs> I am the sex radical that I am because of him. <laughs> it's all Chip's fault. <laughs> He's been such an amazing person opening up new frontiers of thought uh, for us. So where's our introducing My person? Head. Okay. Hi. <laughs> mm, those drugs I took earlier <laughs> must be kicking in. All right. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Welcome. It is an honor to be here. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? See that little uh, sign? Says the new school. This is New York City. This is where all the brainy intellectuals, all the avant-garde transgressives, that's where they hang. That's where they set the agenda for flyover country, right? All, all you uh, people there who are on, aren't down with the latest currents in social cultural theory and are resisting uh, Pride Month, you're, 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 you're yesterday's people. We're in the science fiction future. They say so. The new school for social research Seminar, there's a bunch of grad students sitting in the audience. I recognize the look. It's kind of glazed over zombie-fication look. And they'll clap in anything as long as they think it's going to get them over into the academic world, right? That's And ironically, the new school for social research was, was the institution that opened themselves to refugees fleeing fascism in Germany, right? German... They, they brought in a lot of German intellectual, German Jews primarily, but also some Catholics, other individuals uh, to, to set up their. But you see the revolution, part of that revolution uh, included the subversion of the entire society, especially in the area of its sexual mores, its sexual behavior. And you heard Bell Hooks herself. By the way, I, I read all that literature. I used to read her columns every month that appeared in Z Magazine, published out of Boston. I read all the radical sex literature. I read Pat, Pat Keller. I, that's one of my areas of expertise, research, sexuality, right? But my conclusions are 180 from these so-called sex radicals. So who's the radical? I am the sex radical because I'm not down with the Sabatini and Frank has subsidized uh, transgressiveness of the new school of re social research and the Rothschild bangers that fund these ass clowns. That's who's behind these people. And if you read a lot of their literature, these people are are like monkeys on a typewriter. You know, eventually, if you know the law of averages, they're going to come up with some prose. That's what it's. That's what it reads like. It's it's not very good. At least uh, Philip Dick was a. You know, Asimov, some of these other people, some of the ones that we have been taught to admire, they, they are good writers, but most of them are just awful. And Delaney is one of them. I'm, I'm not an expert on Delaney by any means. I don't claim expertise on any of these people, but he's not a, a literary stylist. He's a propagandist because he was giving blowjobs to people down in the, publish, in the publishing industry uptown, right? People like the Scott and Meredith indus, uh, uh, agency that, that Philip Dick went to. He was trying to sell his science fiction or his um, literary fic. He wrote 10 literary novels that he couldn't, I'm talking about the Philip Dick, and he didn't sell a one, right? He wanted to be a literary fiction writer, but and he get got this guy, Scott Meredith, who, by the way, was also from a Hazarian publishing. He anglicized his name. This is a whole Ugo Gernsbach template here, bankers and publishing, film, media, banking, pharmaceutical, big pharma, all of it, right? You see how, how it articulates as, as a system? So Scott uh, Meredith and the sub-agents would, would, would dictate to Philip Dick 
what kind of writer he's going to be. And you're not, no, we don't, we're not going to be a literary writer. We already got someone here. His name's uh, J.D. Salinger. He, we got him on the hook because he likes little girls too, right? By the way, there's books on him, but uh, uh, J.D., the great J.D. Salinger, Franny and Zoe and Catcher in the Rye, that this great literary genius, how he would write mash letters to teenagers, inviting them up to his little farm there. And some of them had relationships with him. That's J.D. Salinger. I know I read the books. Philip Dick was the same way. He married uh, Tessa B. Dick. Um, that was her married name. Uh, what was her maiden name? I can't remember. But she was 18 years old. He was in his 40s. All right. Am I going to judge? But I'm just saying that there seems to be a pattern here. And I'm sure Sam Samuel Delaney the grand wizard of science fiction, unknowing it as being a master of science fiction. I'm sure there's a grad student out there sitting there who wants to suck his dick and he's going to do it because that's how, that's how these people roll. All right. You understand? I'm sorry for being crude, but that's what it, that's what it comes down to. Read Delaney's book, by the way. Um, I have his latest one. What is it? Uh, where is it here? I didn't bring you the copy. It's about his sex life. And I, I told you before, I, I bought his earlier book in 1999 about how he would just go into these Times Square movie houses and just have an anonymous sex two, three, four, five times a day. Right. And and Maura, or Moira Grayland talks about sex addiction, about her parents, mother and father, whose own parents abused them as a multi-generational sex abuse. And they have the similar types of sexuality and patterns and insatiable need for sexual gratification. And their medium for, for, for uh, revolutionizing the world in sort of a transgressive fashion, like Bell Hook says, she's definitely on drugs. Oh, yeah. She be on drugs. Um, that, that's Sam Delaney, and that's the story of her life i encourage you to read it and i also encourage you as i begin to sign off here <laughs> to uh join my patreon because and subscribe because there's coming attractions one of my great patronistas said hey professor have you heard about this sex called up in the upper uh east side of new york city run by a psychotherapist it was a sex cult I said, no, I have it. So I bought the book. It's called The Sylvanian. So I'm going to read it. Maybe I'll have it ready by next Sunday or, yeah, next week. Um, it's called The Sylvanian Sex, Psychotherapy, and the Wildlife of an American Commune. Right. This is in Samuel Delaney land. This is like Bell Hooks. She's a New Yorker, too. This is where you you go to New York City. You're going to have transgressive sex with, uh, with, uh, with the, one of the Cuomo families, whoever. Right. That's why New York is the place, man, for fashion, for pimping, for Wall Street, for all these types of transactions. Fly over country. We are just dead meat to them. If we let it happen. All right. So that's uh, so join the Patreon. Uh, also, as a last tribute, this is a heavy, a literally a heavy tribute to my patronistas. All right. Thank you, my patronistas, for allowing me to buy this box set, the complete volumes of Harry Potter. Yes, I have assigned myself the task of reading all seven volumes from by J.K. Rowling or someone like her, because <laughs> now she's beginning to interest me. The programming or, or the money, she forgot where the money came from, and she's beginning to go public about gender issues. Right. Harry, she's she schooled a whole generation who are now in the early stages of their career in medicine and law and the legislature. Harry Potter, when they were 12 years old, they were waiting till midnight for the next volume to drop with mommy holding their hand. This is their world. I need to understand a little bit, just like I'm forcing myself with science fiction. I told you I had an aversion to it because I, I didn't want to read about uh, evil Fu Manchu and these little aliens with, with little slivy eyes, right? And they're always, um, you know, from, from, from of Asian, Chai Kam origins. So I gotta read, I'm gonna read Harry Potter. Yeah, I'm not gonna tell you when, I can't tell you 
when I'm going to fit him, but I'm going to give it a try. I'm, I'm, I said the same thing with B, BC Andrews. BC Andrews is not my bag. I someone told me, she says, I've been watching your talks, professor, on YouTube. I said, you got to check out BC Andrews. And I said, I heard about her. Wasn't that flowers in the attic? She says, yeah. And, and and that just, to me opened up a whole realm. I said, all these kids, these little girls who are reading this type of stuff of incest, brother and sister incest, and it's multi-volume. She only wrote three or four, maybe four or five of the first ones. And now it's just some middle-aged guy who probably goes to these uh, comic conventions or science fiction who ghost writes, writes those for V.C. Andrews, so-called. So I'm going with uh, J.K. Rowling, and I'm trying to figure out the whole Harry Potter deal. I know it's late in the day for that. Uh, I did read every single volume of the Ian Fleming 007 series, and I learned a lot about the contemporary economy, which is now based in the Panama area. It, everybody's still fixated on Wall Street and the city of London. No, it's in the Panama area. That's where James Bond was running a lot of his capers because a lot of that post-war wealth is being moved there offshore in anticipation of the new uh, borderless economy as uh, Omai, Japanese theorist political economic theorists, put it the borderless economy, right? So we got we to gotta keep up with these individuals. They're always a step ahead. They're into planning, right? They meet yearly at Davos, Switzerland. They're corresponding with, they write letters and course uh, monographs and, and books to each other. They're very well funded. I'm just one person here with a small, measly, humble, tube you station so if nothing else please subscribe forward my message out there better yet join my patreon for five dollars a month and you'll get a huge return on your invest investment or your money will be cheerfully refunded okay <laughs> yeah i grew up in the asia television so i know how to i know how to shill i know hucksterism Right, because I grew up on commercials. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, go out there, and if you see something transgressive, make sure to hose it down. All right? Okay, bye. Thank you.